Good morning, everybody. How are we all doing? Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. Amen. You know what? I need to tell you something. I want you to pray with me. I'm believing God for a move of His Spirit in this church. Amen? I don't want to come every single week and we just hear a message and we listen to some amazing uh, music and then we go home. Firstly, as I said last week, and uh, the song that Earl sang today is truly just a reflection of what I said last week about you and I actually participating in the worship. we actually giving glory to the Father. Amen? God has not called us to be spectators, but to participate. And so today I want to talk to you about the case uh, for the Holy Spirit. Last week we started this series on the Holy Spirit, and I spoke about the fear of the Lord. And uh, without the fear of the Lord, not being scared of the Lord, but the, the reverential fear of the Lord, we will never see the Holy Spirit. We will never experience the fullness. And along with that goes holiness, because without holiness, we will not see God. And so, this morning, uh, talking about the case for the Holy Spirit. You know, like a lot of new married couples, Gabby and I didn't have very much at first. In fact, we had a little beetle car, and that was it. And we lived in a small apartment, and so we were very careful with our meager funds. We finally managed to go out and buy a new fluffy comforter. It was almost the price of a second mortgage for us. I'm exaggerating, but it really was beautiful. And at bedtime, I walked into our bedroom, and to my horror, no comforter. And I asked Gabby where the comforter was, and she gave me those, those kind of looks that you guys know that I'm, what I'm talking about, kind of looks that says, are you so dense? And she proceeded to let me know that the new comforter was not for us, but for looks when other people came around. And you know, since then we've accumulated a few other things like that. For instance, we have beautiful towels that you can use when you come and stay with us, but I can't use them. <laughs> you know, it's the same way for millions of Christians. We've been given the comforter, but they treat him as if he's just there for looks. We call ourselves Pentecostals, but to many, the precious Holy Spirit is merely an addendum and truly does not function in and through our lives like Jesus explained to his disciples that they would. In fact, I believe there's been a silent divorce in the church, speaking generally. There's a schism between the Word and the Spirit, and that kind of message, the third kind, is the kind of message that appeals to everybody with nothing. So let me explain. You have those on the Word side, they sound doctrine, expository treating, sovereignty of God, and etc., and etc., you may say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, absolutely nothing. And then you have those on the spirit side who stress getting back to the book of Acts. Signs and wonders and miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Again, what's wrong with that? Well, absolutely nothing. And then, of course, the third option, I'm not even going to go into that, the appeal to everybody with nothing. Listen to what Smith Wigglesworth prophesied a number of years ago. In fact, it was 1947. He said, when the new church phase is on the wane, it will be evidenced in the churches something that has not been seen before, a coming together of those with an emphasis on the Word and those with an emphasis on the Spirit. And when the Word and the Spirit come together, there will be the biggest movement of the Holy Spirit that the nation and indeed the world has ever seen. It will be marked with the beginning of a revival that will eclipse anything that has ever been witnessed. And so... What I'm saying simply is there is not an exclusionary gospel, but a solid teaching combined with an acknowledgement and a sensitivity to the Spirit of God. That is what God is wanting to do in the church, I believe, in these days. And so somebody said we often tow our brains around behind us to justify what we believe. Let me explain. 
There are many Christians who would say, my practice and my belief as a Christian are determined by the teachings of the Bible. But Jeremiah 17.9 warns me, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? And so when we think that our hearts are so pure and that we actually, that we accurately, uh, our motives are, are, are pure when we are believing uh, what the Scripture says, many times we are wrong in that. And let me explain why. As you know, we are significantly influenced by our circumstances, by our culture, by the families we grew up in, the church we attended. In fact, maybe we've never attended church. By our teachers and our desires and our goals and disappointments and our tragedies and even the trauma in the Bible only form a small part of that. You know, I come from a culture, an African culture, South Africa, whereas many, all of you, majority of you are, are Americans. Our cultures were different when we grew up. The things that shaped me, that were different to what, they, to what shaped you. And yet we can still be together in Christ. And the majority of Christians believe that what they believe because of the influence of their past and what spiritual teachers have told them. In other words, much of what we believe uh, we base our belief on is second-hand information derived from a series of sources, including the church and friends and so-called more mature believers. And so this morning, what I'd like you to do is just set aside those preconceived ideas and the things that you've gleaned from one source or another about the Holy Spirit, and I encourage you to just listen this morning. I'm not asking you to set aside your spiritual antenna or even your capacity to reason. But please, this morning, objectively listen to me by your spirit. You know, right in this room today, we have a divergent group of people and their thinking and understanding about the person of the Holy Spirit may be very limited, maybe even biased or against him because of some or other thing that had happened in their past. I understand that. I've seen that stuff, and it also made my uh, skin crawl. It made me want to walk away from the things of the Spirit. But then again, I recognize that there are people here who've not heard much about the Holy Spirit, if any teaching on the Holy Spirit. Someone once said this. He said that there are two main great spiritual needs. One is to know and experience forgiveness, and the other is for goodness. God heard our first cry for help, that cry for forgiveness, and answered it through the Lord Jesus Christ. But he also heard our second cry, and that cry for goodness, and that comes uh, in answer at Pentecost. God does not and has not designated that once we become Christians, that we live a life that we previously lived. When we become Christians, we become new creations. All old things have passed away. We've become new again, and that expectation is that we live life differently than we did before. Now, I understand it is a process. It is a process of renewal. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so over a period of time, as our minds become renewed to the Word of God, we begin to live differently. In 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 11 and 12, it says, Fulfill every desire of goodness and the work of faith with power in order that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ might be glorified in you. So how are we going to do that? It is through the Holy Spirit only. And so the great gift of forgiveness, uh, God added to that the great gift of the Holy Spirit to help you and I. The Holy Spirit is the source of power who meets every single one of our needs. And unfortunately, the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the lives of people has been ignored, misunderstood, and misused. And then there, there are people who don't even talk about the topic of the Holy Spirit. Jonathan Edwards once said this. He said, when the church is revived, so is the devil. 
Satan will raise up a counterfeit to imitate sincere seekers of God, to put them off so they will run in the opposite direction. So the degree to which you are able to recognize and embrace that which is real and true, to that degree you will be able to detect and reject that which is false. Amen? Because the Holy Spirit is there to guide us, lead us into all truth. We heard Joshua eloquently read that scripture this morning. So what does he say? He says the Holy Spirit will be there, that if you hear something that is not of God in a church or wherever it is, on the radio, or you're watching it via YouTube, and it doesn't make sense to you, don't ignore that. Because the Holy Spirit might be speaking to you. Yes, it might be something you do not understand. And that's one thing. But many a time when you're hearing people speak, something's just going, "Mm, it's just not on. It's just not there. It's like the station is just turned a little off, that station, and you're hearing a crackling. You mustn't ignore that, folks. Because that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. So as I said, the degree to which you're able to recognize and embrace what is real and truth, to that degree, you'll be able to detect and reject that which is false. Do you know how they teach bank tellers to recognize fake money? They give them over and over. They allow them to handle the real thing. Not the fake stuff, the real thing. So that when a fake note comes across their desk, across their counter, they're able to immediately know that it is fake. That's what I'm talking about. So let me also add that the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit is a person. Jesus never referred to it as it when he was talking about the Holy Spirit. So today I want to introduce you to the person of the Holy Spirit. If you were to pick a verse... What is the most amazing verse in the Bible? I believe it is John 16 and 7. And let me give you some background. Jesus was a short time away from the cross, and he's talking to his disciples. It's the last discourse, they call it. From John 14 to 16, it's called the last discourse. His last teaching sessions. And the first part of John 16, 7 says, I tell you the truth, for it is good for you that I go away. Now pause for a moment. I tell you the truth, that it is good for you that I go away. Think about it. Imagine if you were in their place. Your life has been turned upside down by this man. You've lived in close proximity to him, heard him teach. You've seen him heal. You've seen him love the unlovely. You're convinced that this man held the key to the future with the oppression by the foreign power, and now he's saying he's going to go and leave. You've sacrificed everything, and now he says, I'm going away. Can you imagine what Peter must have said? I just imagine Peter, the bombastic Peter, the rough fisherman. Maybe he said, Jesus, you've got to be joking, man. Are you nuts? He didn't. I don't find that in Scripture. That's just my interpretation. <laughs> Jesus goes on to say, but I tell you the truth, it's good for you that I go away. Unless I go, the counselor will not come to you, and if I go, I will send him to you. Now, that's a staggering statement, folks. You know, I thought I would give anything to have lived back when Jesus lived, to to hear his voice personally, to see his face, to touch him. But then Jesus says the era that you and I are living in today The era of the Spirit is far better than when He was down on earth as well. Jesus is saying, you don't realize how fortunate you are that you have the Spirit of God living in you right now. Now, can you wrap your head around that statement? And think about it. How many of us actually acknowledge the Holy Spirit in our daily lives? What about getting up in the morning and saying, good morning, Holy Spirit? Becoming aware of Him in your daily lives. 
when you're, going in, when you're driving in the car or sitting on a bus or, or when you're in your workplace, whatever you might be doing, when you're, cha- when you're taking care of kids and even changing a dirty diaper. I know that doesn't sound like much of the spirit in the midst of that one, but there we go. But wherever you are, we need to cultivate a, an awareness of the Spirit of God in our lives, that He is there always. I believe that we better be crystal clear on the ministry and the identity of this one that Jesus calls the counselor. I know to miss it would be a disaster, and as a result, so many Christians are living far below their God birth potential. John 16 12. Jesus says, I have so much more to say, more than you can bear. But when He, He, not it, when He, the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will only speak what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. And He will bring glory to me by taking from from what is mine and making it known to you. In other words, Jesus is saying, that the Holy Spirit is the funnel through which all blessings from God come. The Christian life is nothing more, nothing less, than life in the Spirit. In the Greek, it's a word parakletos, which as we know is translated counselor. Now let's just step back to John 14, 16. And he says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor and he will be with you forever. Another counselor? What's he talking about? Who's the first counselor? Jesus is the first counselor, is he not? And who's the other one? The Holy Spirit. And Jesus said he would not leave his friends, uh, would not leave his friends as orphans. And then, this amazing promise, verse 17. The world cannot accept because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. The question is, do we know him? But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. That's the promise of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. If you are a Christ follower, the Holy Spirit actually takes up residence in your life, and Jesus says he is the counselor. And you know, that's, I've been wrestling with that this week. He takes up residence in my life, Here he is. He is part of the Godhead. When the world was spoken into existence, he was there. And yet Jesus says he comes and takes residence in my life. I don't know. This week I couldn't get my peanut finite brain around that. It was just too big for me. And it made me even more aware of my own shortcomings, my own faults. And I know it doesn't come to do, the Holy Spirit doesn't come to do that. But when I understood, when I began to understand the enormity of this God we serve, and yet He found me, and He saved me, and He filled me, it's almost too much to bear. So what does this mean in practical, everyday terms? I want to talk to you about the Holy Spirit being your counselor. So let me first ask you, have you ever made any dumb decisions? Ever worry about things even though worrying didn't do you any good? What about people problems? Did you ever mismanage anger? (laughs) You ever beat yourself up? for things that you did or didn't do? You ever ever have regrets and you look back and you say, man, that was just a knucklehead thing that I did. Well, Jesus says he's going to send what someone called the greatest counselor in the world. So here's the question for each one of us. Has there been a time where you deliberately and intentionally invited the Holy Spirit to take up permanent residence in your heart as a counselor. 
you haven't done that, I encourage you to do that today. And so will you go on this adventure with me of allowing the Holy Spirit to become your permanent resident counselor? Now, what's the work of the Holy Spirit? I want to give you three things quickly. Number one, it's for guidance. How many of you know that when you go to a, a new city and you, you've plugged in Google or Waze, and you know, I love my precious wife, but even watching the Google map, sometimes they off with that, and then Gabby will say, well, why don't you pull over and ask the man over there where we're at? How many guys say, and that ain't going to happen? Of course I won't do that. Asking a stranger just on a theory that even a stranger, total stranger, chosen at random is more likely to know where I am. And of course he might hijack us or he might be an axe murderer. I don't know. So I never do that. Norway. Of course then there's a bad, bad, bad in the car. 1 John 2. <laughs> Addressing the issue of where does wisdom and spiritual guidance come from? He says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. And then goes on. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive from Him remains in you, and you don't need anyone to teach you. Now, are you saying to me, well, I don't have to come to church because I don't need anybody to teach me. That's not what he's saying. Does John, what John, does John say that there should be no teaching pastors and you can just kind of live a life without fellowship of other believers? Of course that's not what he's saying. Yeah, that's what's going on in this passage. There were a, pe a group of people uh, that John's writing was referring to. They were teaching false doctrine. Those are the folks that he's warning about. Those, in verse 26, those that are trying to lead you astray. They're trying to cause dissension, teaching false doctrine, claiming to be spiritually superior, and so on. They were, going to try, they were trying to get away with it by claiming that they had a special authority based on a superior anointing of the Spirit. Then something people will try, then something people will try uh, to make seem is a primary indication of the Spirit's presence is the spectacular or special effects or amazing miraculous things. But you know, the indicator of the Holy Spirit in our lives is the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? Love, joy, peace, gentleness. What John is saying is you all have the Spirit. Don't be like sheep and let somebody intimidate you by claiming spiritual authority. You have as much as anybody and you are as much in direct contact with as anybody else. And so the same spirit that lives in me lives in you. You have as much spiritual authority as I have. Believers shall lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. He's not saying the super spirituals, those who stood up on the pulpit, are the ones that do it only. Believers will lay hands on the sick. And I can uh, tell you a host of other scriptures that go with that. Of course, you still have to study. You still have to use your mind. You still have to do things in community and receive wisdom from other folks and so on. But the Spirit is resident in you as well. I encourage you. Begin to lean on Him in your daily lives. And He has a wonderful promise. Going back to John 16, 13, Jesus makes this amazing statement. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit is concerned about truth. And He will guide you into all truth. And He goes on, He will not speak on His own but will only speak what he hears and he'll tell you what is yet to come. The greatest counselor in the world specializes in guidance counseling. But let me add a word of caution here. 
the Spirit never guides in a way that is a contradiction to the Scriptures. Never in contradiction to the Scriptures. So I go back to what I said. If there's just this little twist in your spirit and there's a contradiction to the Scriptures, walk away. Encourage you always. That's why I give you notes. For you to actually go and check what I re- say on a Sunday. Not only for you to go and check, but it also provides a study or gives you study opportunities for the rest of the week as you allow God to just speak through those notes that I give you. The second thing the Spirit does, I think what often keeps us from experiencing the guidance of the Spirit of God is that we go to God, we lay out our problems with great fervor, and then we say, God, give us wisdom, tell me what to do, and then we get up and we walk away and we do what we want to do. And so, this week, make the Spirit your counselor. Maybe you have a significant decision to make, or you may be confused about a relational issue, or maybe you need wisdom for work, or maybe you need, you need to know how to manage your time. Speak to the, your counselor and ask him how you should do it. Lay it out and then listen and be open to the possibility, to the thoughts and the promptings and the urgings and insights that will come to you, that you will really receive wisdom and it really will be coming from the Spirit because the greatest counselor in the world guides us into wisdom. Now, the third thing that the Holy Spirit does, He empowers us for life. In Ephesians 3 and 16, I pray that out of His or God's glorious riches, He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being at the core of who you are. So what is Paul saying here to us? He says, I pray that you will be made powerful. You will be made powerful, not only in your own, but by the Holy Spirit who gives us the power. A car cannot Move without a battery. The Holy Spirit is your indwelling battery to move you forward as a Christian in this world out there. The Holy Spirit is the source of power for Christian living. Think about it. When the church was born, this was not on Christmas Day. It was not at the crucifixion. It was not even at the resurrection or even the ascension. But Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that the Father has promised you. Now, there are a couple of things about that. A gift is something you get that even that we don't deserve. It's like a birthday gift. Somebody comes and gives you a gift. Maybe you didn't deserve it. Yes, it might be marking occasion. And then he goes on and he says, Acts 1 and 8, but you will receive what? Power. When, when what? When the Holy Spirit comes on you. And what will happen then? Then he says, Then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts, and to the uttermost parts, or the ends of the earth. When was the church born? The church was born on Pentecost. Why? Because that's when the Spirit comes. No Spirit, no church. Jesus, in fact, saying this. He says, don't even try to be the church without the Spirit because the Holy Spirit is God's agent of work in this world and He will empower you to do that which I've told you to do when I said to you, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So from its earliest mention, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was associated with power, but it was sporadic. Think about it. In Judges 14 and 6, it talks about this, this uh, of Samson. It talks about Samson. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power so that he tore apart a lion as he would tear apart a young goat. The Spirit came upon him and he was empowered, but it was just for that incident, just for that moment, and then he left. But you and I have been given the Spirit of God for us forever. There's a wonderful uh, passage in Ezekiel 37 where there's a valley of dry bones. 
It's about His people. There's no life in Him. And then the bones and the sinews and the flesh and the muscles were put on. But there's still no breath in Him. And then the God said to Ezekiel, prophesy of the breath. That what is sovereign, the Lord. Live. And God says, that's what I will do for my people. I will make my spirit come on them and they will live. And maybe that's what we need to be doing in this church. Prophesying over these empty chairs. That God will make people alive. Pentecost is the time when it, that was ultimately fulfilled. God's made His breath, His Spirit, come on the people. Amen? So what is it that you're trying to do apart from the Holy Spirit? What difficulty, what sin are you trying to overcome apart from Him? What tough challenges are you seeking to grow in? What difficult people are there in your life that you're trying to love? What situation has happened in your life where you've been so hurt and you're kind of just stuck and you can't get through it? No matter how hard you've tried, you're just stuck in that place. What risk is out there and you're in fear about taking the next step? Maybe somebody's offered you a job and you're just too scared to take that leap. Let me ask you, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you? Could it be that we orient our lives, even as Christians, more around comfort and security and routine? But there's no place where you're really out on a limb, really depending on the Spirit of God. The greatest counsel in the world often offers us unconditional acceptance. Scripture talks about a metaphor. In Ephesians chapter 1 and 13, he says, Having believed, you are marked in Him with a seal. Now what's that seal? The promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of glory. In the old days, they didn't have post-its or cellophane tape or anything like that. But if there was a document that, that was particularly of particular importance, they used to take a candle. You've probably seen it in the movies and that, and they used to have a seal, with, probably with a ring, and they used to emboss and leave an imprint on that wax at the opening. And the seal was there to say, this document already belongs to somebody, and it cannot be tampered with. Now that's what uh, Paul is saying about the Holy Spirit in you. You have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. God is saying, not because of you, but because of Jesus, you've met my standard. Because Christ died for you, you do not have to worry. You have the seal of God upon you. Quickly. Look at this part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 15. You did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship by which we cry, Abba, Father. Daddy, God. Verse 26. In the same way, the spirit helps us in our weakness. When we do not know it, we ought to pray. The Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. So the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. If you're faced with a challenge, if you're faced with something you cannot do, if you're at the point of stepping into something that you know you should not do, whether it's anger, whatever it is, you can cry out to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, help me. And He goes on. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for all the saints in accordance with God's will. Closing story. Father told me a number of, a while ago about his daughter. His daughter was a, a teacher in grade school, real little kids. And there was this one little girl that was being tested and uh, 
She knows that she's behind everybody, and everybody else knows it. And so the teacher said, the daughter said, she heard this little girl groan and say, oh, I have a bad feeling about this. This was the first test of the year. I have a bad feeling about this. I'm afraid it's going to be like last year. Then the dad said, the daughter put her arm around this little girl and said, I'm going to help you. And we're going to make it together. It'll be all right. It's okay. You're not on your own. Not this year. I'm going to help you. Well, that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. He wants to put his arms around you and say, I'm going to share that deepest hurt. I'm going to share that frustration. I'm never going to leave you, nor am I going to forsake you. You're not alone. If you just let me, we'll do this together. He's the greatest counselor, and he's available today. Amen?